Grazie per l'attesa e benvenuti. Grazie per aver sfidato la pioggia, gli scioperi e anche parecchi disagi nei trasporti. E sono felicissimo di vedere che la nostra community di Cagles è cresciuta così tanto. Sono solo pochi mesi che siamo partiti a marzo di quest'anno e la community è cresciuta sia a livello internazionale, c'è stato Kaggle Days a Dubai, a San Francisco, adesso a Pechino e fra pochissimo, l'11 dicembre, ci sarà anche a Tokyo e anche la nostra community è qui a Milano è cresciuta, abbiamo superato i 500 iscritti. Questa sera non parleremo direttamente di gare di Kaggle, ma parleremo degli strumenti che ci aiutano a performare meglio in queste gare e magari anche a posizionarsi vincendole. In modo particolare avete notato che molte gare ormai sono focalizzate sul deep learning e quindi quale miglior argomento che trattare di TensorFlow nella nuova versione 2.0. E parleremo anche però di un'altra cosa a fianco di TensorFlow, l'AutoML. Cos'è l'AutoML? È il machine learning automatico. Sempre più spesso avrete notato che alcune gare utilizzano come benchmark soluzioni di AutoML. A San Francisco, nell'Hackathon, la soluzione di benchmark era così robusta che soltanto un team alla fine è riuscito a piazzarsi e a posizionarsi meglio di tal benchmark. Per questo avremo questa sera con noi una persona da voi sicuramente conosciuta e apprezzata, Antonio Gulli, Engineer Director a Londra presso l'ufficio del CTO che ci racconterà sia di TensorFlow che soprattutto di AutoML. Però prima di lasciare la parola ad Antonio, vorrei chiamare qui sul parco Maurizio Spadaccino del nostro team Data Scientist del RISC. Benvenuto Grazie. Maurizio. Mm, Ari, noi benvenuto uh, da parte di Limiti. Uh, conoscete già la realtà, immagino, è una, è una banca di nuovo paradigma, è una challenger bank, quindi in, con un'impostazione eh, pienamente digitale, questo da un lato, sul lato della raccolta, sul lato degli impieghi è un qualcosa di più, eh, focalizzata sostanzialmente sulle sofferenze, sugli MPL, eh, su intervenire quindi in un settore particolarmente cruciale e importante soprattutto in questo momento eh, per l'economia italiana. E, mh, Luca eh, si è unito al nostro gruppo di Risk Analytics che è eh, guidato da Giacomo, Giacomo Lepera, e siamo un gruppo di una decina tra data scientist e developers, e fanno parte tutti della divisione eh, del CRO, del nostro Chief Risk Officer Claudio Nordio, che ringrazio. E, mh, niente, lascio brevemente la parola ad Antonio che può intervenire. E, mh, alla fine del suo intervento ci sarà uh, l'occasione per fare un rinfresco, un aperitivo, un po' di networking se avete voglia. Grazie. Prego Antonio. So I need to, okay. First question is, Italian or English? I want to understand the majority of people, what do you prefer? I was recently in Paris. I understand French. I can speak a bit of French. But it was a very interesting experience for me. How many people will prefer to have this in English? I think we should be inclusive and be in English. Anyone has problems if I speak in English? Okay, it's okay? Can I go up with English? Well, I'm, sono italiano, non vi confondete. I say only a few words in Italian, uh, if you don't mind. Um, sono italiano e sono del sud Italia, e ho studiato a Pisa. Um, what I said is, I'm from south of Italy, and I studied in uh, Pisa, which is not far away from here, it's in Tuscany. And then, uh, I've been in many different places, uh, even if these days is a bit unusual. I, I consider myself like a European guy. Uh, it's a bit unusual because you know what I mean. Uh, but um, I have a friend of mine who said uh, he's in Beijing. We, are, we, we talk a lot. He said to me that if you travel a lot, you tend to see more similarities than differences, right? Um, Today I work for Google. I don't introduce myself. I will do this during the presentation. I work for something called Office of the CTO. Um, and, okay, today I want to talk a bit about uh, TensorFlow and AutoML. But, please, I hate when I do a presentation and people are silent. There is a bit of culture in this. I, don't expect, I do not expect Italians to be 
silent. In other, in other countries, it's like part of the, of, the, of the culture. So I will ask you questions, OK? And if, because the problem is, if I talk and you stay silent, I'm lost. I have no idea if I'm saying something that is completely nonsensical or you are simply uh, agreeing with me. I simply don't know, OK? So the organization, only one slide to talk about the organization that I, I work. Uh, essentially, is uh, uh, my role is uh, I started to work in data science when data science was not around. Well, when the term was not around. That's what I mean. Um, I started to work in search. My background is in search in 97. And I had my own startup here in Italy. I made three startups in Italy. The first two were a complete failure. I was not having money to buy food. I'm not, uh, I have no sh I'm, I'm not shy to say this, because I was putting all the money in. And this was a very different moment uh, in Italy. The third one was a good exit. I sold this company to uh, Tiscali. I don't know if you remember Tiscali. Um, how many people remember at this audience uh, Arianna? Well, this is quite telling about your age. <laughs> And my age, and my age, and my age. Arianna was one of the first search engine. Uh, actually, I went recently in um, in, uh, um, in, the, in a museum in uh, in, um, in San Francisco, and I'm so proud to say that Arianna was just before Google in this museum. I work for Google, of course. I work for this organization that uh, works with large customers, uh, but the idea is to do things together. Okay, so my role is a technical role. Don't ask me anything about sales because I have no idea about this. Uh, I'm also very lucky because Google allowed me to write a number of books uh, in this sector, uh, in the sector of machine learning. Uh, my interest for, uh, so let's start with questions. How many people in this audience use, uh, have ever used Keras? Okay, wow. How many people are using TensorFlow version one? And anyone is playing with TensorFlow to zero? Okay, less people. Anyone has played with uh, uh, any formal AutoML? Whatever is the definition of AutoML. Okay, so guys, one of the problems that I have when I do a presentation is that I don't like to do a presentation in standard. This was made. And the problem was that I was, not, I, I was not, not having any idea of the audience in front of me. So I assumed that the people were starting. And, uh, but there are also some concepts that are advanced. Stop me if anything is not clear to anyone, OK? The first book I wrote was uh, uh, this one, Deep Learning with Keras. This started, uh, started four years ago uh, in Amsterdam. I tend to write a book in every single city where I go. So this was written in Amsterdam. This was written in uh, uh, um, uh, Warsaw. I was working in Amsterdam for three years and in, North, in Warsaw for rather three years. And then uh, these two books had uh, some kind of success and were translated in, Chi in Chinese and Japanese, two languages that I don't speak. I speak five languages, but not this, this, this language. Um, so I don't know if they are saying uh, things that make sense. They said in China that they are OK. So in India, these books are particularly. Um, uh, so today, right now, I'm in London. Of course, I'm writing a new book, uh, which will be out, sorry, a shameless advertising, will be out in, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm the final review of this book, together with two other guys, one lady, one, one uh, person is in India, and another guy is in San Francisco. And uh, essentially, is the follow-up of these two books. Um, how many people are using PyTorch, by, by the way? OK. Any other framework that I was not mentioning? OK. Please. Cafe. Anyone is still using Teano? You should. Teano is cool. Uh, I belong to Google. This is a standard slide for Google. Uh, but I quite like this slide. It's the only one that I think is properly coming from Google. 
No, there are two more, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm very happy to work for this company uh, because this mission, I truly believe, let's put it like this, I truly believe that um, any single company is representing the founders. And uh, I think that Larry Page and Sergey Brin are indeed, shape, they shape the, 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 the company. Uh, we use a lot of machine learning in, in Google, like since forever. Is there any brand here that you don't know? Okay, I think you know. But what is really interesting is that, of course, in all of them, we use, in a very massive way, machine learning. My latest project was to work on something that is related to the uh, optimization of the jobs allocation into the fleet. Uh, we have an internal system, it's called Borg. Uh, probably you heard about Kubernetes. Borg is the internal system that we have, was, uh, was before Kubernetes. And there are millions of machines out of there. And then every one of these, and many others, are generating uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs. And there is a problem to allocate these jobs into the, the, the fleet in many data centers. This is a problem, a problem that is at, at the edge of uh, uh, operative research and machine learning. That's where I, where I work, essentially. This is where, where I work internally to Google. Okay, so I, I want to talk a bit about TensorFlow to zero, but not too much. I want to focus a bit more on, on AutoML. Um, so you, you probably know the story, right? So there was a, a TensorFlow, there was a kernel on the top of which Keras was, uh, was running. Uh, I had the pleasure to start working with Keras uh, probably four years ago. At the time, there was something called Lasagne. Lasagne, I don't know if you, if you remember Lasagne. And also Chainer. And then uh, the first time I saw Keras, I saw that it was extremely elegant as an API. And I had the pleasure to meet Francois, who is the, the guy who made Keras. And this was before. Um, uh, Keras was uh, essentially part of, uh, of, of TensorFlow. Uh, and I found this extremely, extremely elegant as a, as a as API. I started to code. Um, so I think that the majority of the people in this audience are using Keras, so I don't talk too much about, about this. But I like very much the idea that you can compose different modules. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there was TensorFlow where essentially the idea was, uh, uh, let's have a computational graph. Let's build this computational graph, and let's consider any, any type of job in, in, in machine learning like a computational graph, which is not necessarily a new idea. Uh, in many environments in uh, computer science, the idea of computational graph was, was built. But many people, they found this really very difficult as a paradigm to, 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 uh, to program. So TensorFlow to Zero is adopting Keras as a main API. And uh, there is a total convergence between the two APIs, uh, up to the point that you don't need to use things like session, session for, the, for, for, for the graph. You simply program with a Keras paradigm. This is one thing. Probably the most important uh, innovation in TensorFlow to Zero is something that was coming actually by other, uh, was already use it in other paradigms, which is uh, uh, in TensorFlow 1.0, the, the normal paradigm is uh, you have a computational graph, you first define the graph, and then you run the graph. There is a complete separation between the two things. Why? Because in this way, the compiler can actually run a lot of optimization. Okay. And, uh, and that's extremely important for efficiency. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, there was PyTorch, China, and other uh, frameworks. They were essentially saying, no, instead of having a computational graph that is compiled, I have an interpreter. So I can actually build this, this graph of computation, um, and then I can interpret this, and I can change this in a dynamic way. Uh, of course, what you expect to have is something in the middle. You should expect to have something that is like a just-in-time compiler, where the, 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 you basically take the best of the, bot, of the two words. 
that's exactly the eager computation. So what is happening is that you define a code in Keras, and then there is a, a compiler that is taking this, and on the, on the flight is generating code that is optimized. So it's a dynamic graph, essentially. Uh, if there is any question on these aspects, stop me if I'm saying something that are clear to you. How many people have already worked with eager uh, computation in terms of flow to zero? Only one person. Okay. Uh, this is my recommendation. I, I understand that many people are familiar with TensorFlow 1.0, but there is really no need anymore to use the computational graph. So if you are coming from Keras, from the Keras uh, stream, everything will be super easy for you, because essentially you don't need to learn anything new. If you're coming from TensorFlow 1.0 and never saw Keras, probably things are a bit more complicated, but trust me, it's worth the investment to learn now, and it's pretty simple. It's not, no, nothing really complicated. These two aspects are simple. What I really like is this aspect, uh, which is not completely supported. Some, some of these, uh, for instance, we are going into the details, are still experimental. What is this? Well, one of the reasons why, uh, essentially, uh, deep learning started to be uh, extremely popular was because all these matrix computation, you can actually run this in GPUs, right? And it's extremely efficient. The problem is that how many people are using CUDA here? Okay, there are still people. Can I ask what you do with CUDA? If you don't mind, anyone? Please, don't be shy. Well, what type of application you run in CUDA? Okay. Uh, one of the problems is that if you, if you use CUDA, like at the lower level, the code is really very complicated. It's like the lower la layer of uh, APIs for CUDA are, are, are hard. I mean, the progress made with CUDA was significant, but the APIs are really very hard. Um, TensorFlow uh, to zero is a very high level of abstraction, really very high level of abstraction. You write one code, and then if you want to run on GPUs, on TPUs, or with a parameter server, I'm going to explain what is a parameter server in, in, in a second, you just simply change one method, which is called strategy. So the code is the same. You just define an object, which is a strategy, and you say, I want to have a strategy that runs on GPUs, or on TPUs, or on a parameter server, or a mix of this, of this combination, which is extremely powerful. Uh, release candidate zero, which is the one that I started to work, uh, was only supporting GPUs. Now, all of them are supported with uh, the final version, the GA version, but uh, you cannot still mix this. this uh, uh, if you want to have a reason to try uh, TensorFlow to zero, go for it. This is the reason. You have a, a, you have a very clean code, and uh, uh, you don't really care. You can experiment in multiple environments. Uh, still, uh, I think that two one will support the mix of everything. I think that if you uh, use the night build, there is already a partial support for mixed environments. Um, questions on this, please. Okay, I'm not going to, t to cover this, but I'm happy to answer to this question. Uh, there are two options there. Uh, depends on what you want to do. One option is to use KubeML. Yes. One option is to use KubeML, uh, which is supporting this. And the other one is to go to TFX. Uh, depends. Uh, TFX is more used for production, while uh, KubeFlow, I found uh, this more... Uh, uh, easy to run uh, like tests and uh, experiments. But yes, it's possible. <laughs> TFX is part of the uh, ecosystem. I'm anticipating a bit this part. Essentially, in TFX, you have things like TFServe, which is uh, serving a model that is trained in production. <laughs> the other new thing in, uh, there are many things. I'm writing a book right now that is like 600 pages. 
and I'm trying to concentrate everything in one slide, which is impossible, of course, right? Uh, but I also like the support for bindings, not only myself, together with two other guys, sorry. Uh, like there are many new languages that are supported. Uh, TensorFlow internally is written in C++. There are single modules that are in C++, and then there are, by, of course, Python is the language. Uh, how many people are using like the TensorFlow Keras with Python? Anyone else is using any other different language? Guys, okay, Swift is a good choice. If you want to, to experiment a bit with Swift, it's a good choice. Of course, I use also Python. Um, so no one there to go outside of Python. Okay. Um, today, I also want to talk a bit about something else, which is AutoML. Uh, anyone played uh, any Kaggle composition? How many people use, are using Kaggle? OK, not so many. Okay. Uh, I spend one, one word about Kaggle. Uh, Kaggle is a company made by one guy, it's called Anthony. I, I, I know Anthony quite well. Um, and uh, became essentially the place where you want to go to, for two reasons, essentially. One is if you, uh, have, uh, if you want to find data sets. If you want to find a reference model of kernels written by someone else, there is a third aspect that, like, also, to prove yourself against, uh, you know, against in a positive sense, I'm saying this. Prove yourself how good you are compared with uh, um, other people out there, right? One guy is sitting here, and uh, Google decided to acquire this company uh, some time ago, but keeping uh, completely independent. So, of course, Kaggle is part of Cloud AI, our division that is doing AI. But there is a, a clear mandate to maintain the, the internally things in a very uh, different way. Uh, before going into the details of this thing, how many people are familiar with things like uh, dense network, CNN, RNN? Should I explain something or uh, is not so many? Okay, CNN, like probably. 50%. Okay, this is not a talk about explaining CNN, explaining RNN, explaining a dense network. You can buy my books if you want. <laughs> well, before uh, I was discussing, what's your name? Abhishek. Abhishek, okay. Abhishek was saying to me that he, he, he saw my books and he's also following me on, 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 on LinkedIn. I think that I was lucky because I've read this book a bit before other people. And there are other books that are even better than my book that were written later, honestly. Um, I started to be interested in machine learning when I was at university. And I went into this trajectory. I was doing a, a parallel computing. My background at the time was parallel computing on things that you probably never heard, like Connection Machine 2, Connection Machine 5. And then there was this uh, uh, course at the university that was about something called optimization. And since I was having this behavior of turning on the computer in the morning, going to take a coffee while it was booting, this was like, I thought probably I, I should do this course optimization. This was a moment where when the computers were taking minutes to, 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 to boot. Uh, I, I took this course, and then uh, neural networks went dust just after I took this course. But I, I, many concepts that were there uh, are still very valid. One of the problems that there is with machine learning, and with deep learning in particular, sorry, my talk is more on, on, about deep learning, is that uh, things like single components are very well understood. Like if you take a CNN, there is an understanding of why CNN can work well in vision. Like it's not like there is a strong theory behind it, but you can make sense what, what CNN, CNN is doing. If you take an error uh, re recurrent neural network, it's very clear. Well, it makes sense why this works well with like things, I don't know, time series. Um, 
you don't need to have a strong background to understand why these things are really very realistic. The real problem is when you start to compose these things. If you see the winners in Kaggle, there are two aspects there that are really very manual. One is, how do you compose these single components? Second, how do you build the samples, samples of this composition? So a typical pipeline of, of deep learning is, I don't know, you take CNN pooling, CNN pooling, CNN pooling. And then you have something that, like AlexNet or many things that are like this. Um, if you read one single article explaining a CNN, you will understand this. Because essentially a CNN, what it's doing is scanning the image and trying to build intuition around this image. I'm not going into the details. The problem is this composition is manual and is a kind of magic. There is no theory behind it. There is no intuition behind it. It works. Why? Because people are making, you know, like, test and test on different architectures, and then they say, this is working. But really, of course, it's working very, very well. That's the point. No one really understands why it works really, really, very well. But the question is, what if there is a variant that no one ever experimented, and uh, this variant is even better? So there are two approaches there. One is, uh, let's try to build a theory behind it. Good luck. Maybe. The second one is, let's try to make this a bit more automatic. This is the first problem, right? Ah, by the way, I'm using you as a test, because my books are discussing about this thing. So. You are quite silent. Probably the books will not go so well. The second, the second problem is, assume that you composed all these different um, um, components. Then there are a lot of parameters that you need to fine tuning. Right? And what do you do? You typically run experiments on experiments on experiments on experiments, and then you try to find, to find a, a combination of hyperparameters hyper that really works. Again, no theory behind it, no clear understanding of why this is working, but it works. For sure it works. So these are two important problems. How we compose the uh, architecture and how we find the, the uh, com perfect combination, optimal combination, or any combination of hyperparameters. Of course, it's not only that. We have also a problem of data preparation. We have a problem of feature engineering. How many people are here in the university? How many people are in the industry? There is anyone taking a PhD? Well, you guys have a lot of problems that you can think about solving, the people who are at university, and also the people who are in industry. Uh, don't even think that this is a solved problem, right? Like, I'll give you one example. When I started to write the first book, guns were just starting. Guns are um, essentially two networks that are competing and learning one against the other. It was this brilliant intuition, one of the best things that I think was ever taught, which is very simple. You learn copying the other and competing with the other. GANS, which are, uh, GANS stands for uh, um, uh, Generative Adversarial Networks. Uh, four years ago, they were just starting. In four years, we saw like millions of applications of GANS. What I'm saying is that this is a sector where there are a lot of opportunities to innovate. I, I truly believe that we are just at the beginning. Plus, I'm talking about, about um, uh, you know, like a bit of architecture here. But there is another important uh, uh, sector, which is probably where the banks are, are working, which is all the applications that you can build on the top of this. Now, AutoML is an attempt to try to make this a bit more uh, uh, automatic. So let's see what is this. Uh, 
All the people here are experts in computer science, I assume. There is anyone here that is just curious and is coming from any other discipline? Please, what do you do? Can I, can I, can I ask, if you don't mind? Digital company. Scrap dealer. What is this thing? I have no idea. Understood. Well, the thing is, we should not be arrogant, right? Uh, people who are in computer science. Whatever we are developing is a tool. I truly believe that machine learning today will be databases in, in 10 years. What this, I mean, is something that is like well known. And is a kind of box that anyone who is not an expert in this particular discipline should use. That's the, what, what, um, um, AutoML is trying to do. And this is at the very beginning. Nothing, I'm not saying that the problem is solved. I'm just saying that this is at the very beginning. But it's, it, it starts to work really, really very well. Uh, this is what I was saying before. ML is essentially a combination of manually designed um, deep composition of well understood modules that are manually composed by experts. And uh, the composition itself is a manual process. We want to uh, go behind the situation. It's very clear what's the problem statement. Anyone ask? Okay. Uh, this is what uh, you were saying before. There was a moment which is like, uh, oh gosh, this is something, becoming something interesting. Uh, and that really created some problem, I can say this from the inside, it created some problem internally to Google, this one. Uh, why? Because Kaggle has the uh, intent, and this is by design, to be completely independent from Google. There is no bias, absolutely no bias. This is by design. But this team that was doing AutoML was a, a team of Google. By the way, they started to compete without people who Kaggle not aware of this before the composition. And so we had to, to also decide what we wanted to do with, uh, with, 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 with this thing. Um, but there was an attention because essentially the first, uh, the first player in the composition was uh, an AutoML generated uh, uh, system. Uh, and uh, the winners at the end, they, they won for a very short amount of time at last moment. So th this was the moment where uh, there was an ah moment for the first time uh, AutoML became something like something concrete. Uh, and this is the, 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 the competition. At the end, what happened was that this team here won about a very short uh, margin, very small uh, margin. OK, so let's try to be a bit more uh, clear on what is this AutoML. Any single uh, machine learning pipeline can be described in three different phases. One is data preparation, or the second one is feature engineering. Probably you are familiar with this. The third one is automatic model generation. It's true that uh, deep learning is actually reducing a bit the importance of this phase, because what we tend to do is to take all the features we have, and give this to a machine learning model, which is like a deep learning model, and then this deep learning model somehow will try to select, will learn how to select the important features. But still, we do a lot of this. We probably do way less than before when there was no deep learning around, but still it's really very important. So there are opportunities of making all these three different steps automatic, not only focusing on this, but all the, all the different three. Uh, the first one is how many times you build a pipeline and you need to do with like wrong data types or missing values. Of course, you do standard things like normalization, uh, putting in different buckets. Can you explain me how do you, you decide what to do? You just have some intuition, right? That you build over time. So why you call this data science? You should call this data intuition. Because that's what you do. 
Let's be honest. There is no science in what we are doing. Science is something different. So if we really want to do science, we need to start about, sorry, I'm provocative on purpose, because here there are people that we build the next things, right? So you, you, you need to be, uh, I'm bringing this a bit to the stream. But if you are really honest, you do this manually. With no intuition, right? Now, there is a new generation of articles that are trying to uh, make this a bit more complicated, a bit more systematic. Even when you do augmentation, for people who are not familiar with this, augmentation is essentially, I take, I take some data set, I apply some kind of transformation, typically if I have images, I rotate, I crop, and I do things like this. I try to increase the number of the samples for my training set, right? But it's all manual. You decide what you do, and then, uh, in reality, what, what, what I think that is happening, what we know is happening, is that this large event, uh, uh, we, we learn because we have a lot of data available. But it's not like we follow a scientific approach to more based on this on intuition. Anyone disagree? You are too silent. There is anything scientific that you do in this step. Okay, I'm, I'm provocative on purpose. Sorry if I do this. Um, but I'm pretty sure that if you think about this, you can come with techniques to make this a bit more automatic. Like, for instance, think about normalization. That's probably the easy step, right? Normalization is an easy step. Argumentation? A bit more complicated because augmentation is depending on the domain. You can imagine that augmentation for images is very different from augmentation for text, right? But here it's not really very difficult. Missing values, you can probably build some machine learning model that is learning how to correct missing values. So I'm starting to tell you. But in reality, what you really want to do is to build machine learning models that are solving these meta problems. While so far, what we do is that we solve a specific problem. So there are people who are starting to think, saying, hey, can I solve the meta problem? Because today we are doing machine learning in the, right, in the wrong direction. We are doing machine learning to solve this domain-specific problem, but we should solve patterns. And this is here that you have many patterns. I'm not, uh, sorry, this talk is not necessarily talking about solutions, okay? Because I don't want to create a bias on you. You can go out tomorrow and start to build your, your own uh, new way to tackle this problem. But I, I, I hope that you agree with me that there is a problem. Do you? Okay, I see people that are agreeing. That's good. Um, here, in reality, there is already something, right? Like, we do have techniques that are saying this feature is actually selecting, um, there is some correlation between these two features, so this second feature can be discarded. This feature is more selective. We have tools, statistics tools that are saying this, but still, we rely on humans saying, I pick this, I pick that. There are some initial tools here that are starting to do this a bit more automatic. But again, there is no like large scale machine learning applied to solve this particular problem. <coughs> Internally to Google, we have techniques that we are using to, 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 to solve this problem. And if you are interested, many of these techniques are public because we publish a lot by, the, by default. There are many, many articles describing what we are doing in this, in this sector. These two initial parts are not completely new. The third part, oh, sorry, of course. Uh, well, that's what we do, right? When there is a problem, we try to push more data, tune this parameter, and uh, it will work manually. But then, of course, if you put in your CV that you are a data scientist, this has a value, economical. So you do this, of course. Uh, 
Uh, the, well, I would, I would prefer to say data engineering. That would be the definition that is more, more appropriate. But there is a lot of intuition, right? Yes, yes, sure. <laughs> I'm provocative, but I, I, I like your approach. You, you are following, I mean, you are, this is the spirit indeed. Uh, this is the part that is new. And with new, I mean uh, starting 2016, so three years ago. The first seminal, seminal paper was from Google in 2016. There are two problems to solve here. I anticipated a bit this part. One is, come on, really? We compose this CNN with pooling, with, with, uh, with uh, skip connection, with RNN. Uh, sorry, I'm going a bit more technical here, but uh, these are like any machine learning book will explain to you what are these things. But we compose these things manually. It's like if you take a car and you have tires, you have an engine, and then someone manually assembling this without having any there must be something more. And then there is the problem of hyperparameter hyper tuning. Once you have this uh, composition, how you fine tune these parameters. Let's give some intuition on what was the seminal paper that tackled this. And then I talk a bit about this as well. Well, again, uh, how many people are using, uh, like, just importing a model that is already pre-trained and perhaps doing some fine tuning. Do you do any like uh, fine tuning, like uh, transfer learning? Okay. Transfer learning is something interesting because uh, the idea is that you start with a model that someone who had lots of data sets, uh, sorry, lots of training data for training set, and lots of computational power, typically GPUs, created this network that is already pre-trained. And then you have a problem in a domain that is a bit similar to the domain where you are. And uh, you use, you basically stand stands on the shoulder of a giant. Use this model that is already trained. You do some fine tuning on the top of this model. And then you use in a domain that is quite close, but sometimes not so close. It actually gave a significant boost to machine learning. But we are moving more and more in a situation like this, where indeed people who are not experts in a particular domain, they can uh, use. I don't see why. And someone, um, there was an article recently that was written by someone who is uh, uh, people who are doctors, and they really improved. They solved problems, and they started to tweet like crazy because this article was published. Uh, they solved problems that were never solved before in, the, in their domain. Uh, so, again, I'm not, sol I'm not uh, giving solutions. I'm, pro I'm offering to you problems to solve. But it's clear that what we do manually, which is a composition of all these different techniques, the dif different uh, small modules, can be done in a more automatic way. Okay. How, we will see how in a, in a second. And then there is a typically a very large space of hyperparameters to be tuned. And if you see, indeed, the composition in Kaggle are frequently, teams are trying to optimize either creating assembles or trying to optimize uh, uh, hyperparameters. Assembles are frequently, like, you take one composition, then you take another composition, then you take another composition, and then you try to compose this into an assemble, which is like a super kind of composition. Uh, the first paper was written three years ago, a paper from Google. The intuition is the following. I'll give you only the intuition, and then uh, if you are not familiar with this, I strongly encourage you to start reading from this paper. My, my, my deck is shared, so it's on the appendix. How many people are familiar with uh, um, um, reinforcement learning? OK, not so many. Reinforcement learning is a technique that was made popular by DeepMind, but of course is something that is existing since 30 years, if not more. Where there is an agent, 
And this agent is uh, learning, no rules are given to the agent. The agent is learning, taking into account the feedback provided by the environment. Okay? Uh, of course, there are uh, books and 30 years of research in this. Was made popular by, of course, with, uh, AlphaGo and, and, and things like this. Now, the idea is the following. What if I take a network that is called controller, and this network works with uh, reinforcement learning, and this network is actually controlling another network that is changing over time. This other network is mutating, and the controller is using reinforcement learning to assess the quality of this other network. In a way, this is an evolution of something that started four years ago with GANs. Because if you think about this, there is some similarity with GANs. The new thing is that in this paper, this side, the, the network that was controlled that was a recurrent neural network. And this other side uh, is, of course, is um, uh, reinforcement learning. The seminal paper was this. The seminal paper had to compete with, probably you are familiar with CIFAR, which is like one of the data sets for images. Uh, this paper was beating the state of the art of 30 years, if not more, of research in this particular data set. And this was the seminal paper three years ago. Uh, and was also faster, sorry, not only was, was, um, was, um, uh, was better in terms of precision, accuracy, but was also uh, more efficient. Okay. Uh, immediately after that, like six months later, there was a, another breakthrough still coming from Google, uh, which is called efficient NAS. Ah, sorry, this is called uh, new, uh, network architecture search because there is a search in exploring. There was another one which gave an improvement of like 1,000 times. Uh, and the idea here was like every time, there is an, every time we generate a new mutation of this network, we still maintain some parameters from the, from the past. We don't start completely from, 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 from scratch. Uh, this happened like essentially three years, a bit less ago. Since then, there are thousands of papers uh, available. But if you are not familiar with this and you want to start doing something like this, I would suggest to start with these two papers because they are really well written. Now, of course, my talk is three parts. I'm about to conclude in a little while. Now there is a bit more of shameless advertising, not because I work for Google. Uh, I, by the way, one, uh, I'm coming to you in a second. Um, one chapter of my book is totally defined, uh, devoted to this. Um, and uh, here I'm giving all the intuitions, please. <laughs> ah, uh, OK, the question is, what's the, what's the difference between this model and genetic algorithms? How many people are familiar with genetic algorithms? Oh, many. Because genetic algorithms are, are, are already are, are in books. Well, uh, first, before answering, genetic algorithms are working in this way. Um, essentially, there is uh, um, some inspiration from biology, where there are four bases, and then you have mutations like crossover. You, you, you mutate the, um, the um, you represent a problem with a sequence of, of, of bits. Uh, any single problem is encoded in this sequence of bits. And then there are operations that are fundamentally inspired by, by uh, genetic. And uh, the difference is that, in reality, there is something coming from that world as well. But the point is there is a reinforcement learning that, uh, network that is checking the mutation. So it's partly inspired by that, but there is an, another important component, is that this controller is controlling this. While in genetic algorithms, there is no idea of reinforcement learning. There is no idea of uh, um, controller. Am I answering to you? 
Partly of this is coming from uh, the genetic, or genetic uh, algorithms, but the, mm, absolutely in genetic algorithms, no one ever thought about using reinforcement learning to mutate a network. Please. Okay, the, the question is, uh, can you give me an idea of what's, what's the computation for doing this? Uh, it's a lot. Uh, I, I don't quote me on this because I'm not completely sure that I remember the number, but if I'm not mistaken, this was wor working. Uh, this one was on 2,500 machines. Uh, but check the paper. So uh, what I'm saying is, is, is significant. It's not small. Don't, don't quote me on the 2,500 because I'm not sure that I remember the number. But it's large. It's large. Uh, Sorry, here I was explaining what I said before. Do you agree with this? I, of course, I read a lot of this, okay, so I don't know what issue, but I go there every day and check what's there. Uh, now, it's not like I'm going to, solve, to say, hey, this is like you solve your problem, you lose your job, but this is done. No, no, not at all. I really like what you said, by the way, that you said that this is a, a very interesting baseline. I see a bit more of a baseline because I don't tolerate the fact that all these things are manual, right? So it's, it's, it's clearly the right direction to go, but it's not like we stop to, to work. When I make this parallel with databases, there is a, a job there, which is database optimiza optimization, right? So there are people who build careers on this. I think that we are going in that direction. I may be wrong. This is just Antonio thinking this, okay. Ah, uh, this is the pipeline that was, uh, win, uh, was sorry, uh, arrived second of the Cairo competition. In, uh, and of course, like, Feature engineering, and there is a bit of architecture search, upper uh, parameter tuning. And this was running on, I was not broke, 2,500 machines. But the, the difference was that people in Kaggle, typically, they go there and check parameters. People, the team behind this was a team of two people checking Borg jobs when they were concluding. Nothing more. Borg jobs are the internal jobs that we have in Google. I mean, it was more like engineering part. This is coming from the paper. <laughs> um, I, I, Google has a full set, and uh, trust me, go there and play. I, I don't have demos tonight, but tomorrow try, try to go there and play because the full set is covering, uh, uh, well, this I can skip because this is, depends on the audience, but I think that you understood the idea. The, bull, the full set is covering f uh, all these different domains. So there is a, uh, there is a full set of, of AutoML for, for uh, natural language. So entity detection, uh, sentiment analysis, th this type of things. And it's actually working pretty, pretty well. Try this. Uh, translation is better than uh, Google Translate, so probably you are familiar with the, with the quality of this. Um, Video intelligence is really very interesting because it is object identification. Uh, and uh, this is where uh, this paper on, uh, on uh, um, uh, this was uh, about detecting cancer, if I'm not mistaken, was used. And then this is uh, the part of classification. The part of classification is actually based on the second paper that I was discussing before, a variant of, of, of this. But it's very simple. Here I will be extremely fast. You load your data set. Uh, you have a look, a bit of a look to the, to the labels. And then uh, you achieve this average position. Now, there is no magic. Go there and try. Okay. And then tomorrow, uh, there was one guy that, uh, so some time ago I did, uh, I did a PhD course in Pisa because I wanted to give back something. And my, uh, um, my assignment was, you go and compete on Kaggle. And you need to be in the top uh, one third um, results. And uh, today I cannot do this. Because they go there and uh, the system will do this on their behalf. And then they have the assignment for, uh, 
for PhD, which probably I cannot do. Uh, okay, and I think that this was the end of it. If you want to uh, connect me on uh, LinkedIn, uh, I will be more than happy to answer to more questions. Um, of course, now is time if you have questions, I will be answering. Please. What is the missing bit preventing us to uh, work with this AutoML um, is somehow the part of compliance and uh, explainability of these models. Um, well, c can you, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, uh, uh, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, well, I, I, I know a bit less about compliance because compliance is also depending on the place where you are and the definition of compliance is very different, let's say, for instance, in Italy or in the UK. But there is a fundamental problem that you are raising is how can I interpret these results? Uh, again, I, I'm provocative. Uh, I do this like frequently. Is uh, Do you think that if you build a, a system manually, like you compose this architecture, you understand better? Uh, well, not, not, not uh, for sure, but at least in the phase of uh, feature engineering, I can somehow um, compare the relative importance of some features, and I can build models that eventually turns these uh, feature into understandable sentences that mm. and what if a lawyer uh, can uh, understand. Uh, so uh, again, I'm, so I was living in Amsterdam. People in Amsterdam are extremely blunt. So let me let me take my Dutch uh, behavior. What if you are dealing with uh, two millions of features? Any significant problem? Any like any. If you are a bank and you are doing a risk analysis, you probably don't have the 100 features. You probably you start to work with 1,000 and then you go to like 1 million. So what I'm saying is uh, I'm not pushing back on you. You are raising a very important, uh, fundamental open problem. I'm saying that the approach of I understand the features is not scalable. And I think that you don't disagree with you. Your problem is still open, and there is not a single solution. What is starting to, 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 to happen, but it's just the beginning, is that in some domains, like for CNN, there are specific solutions that are saying, I see why these are activated. And there are some visualization techniques, for, but this problem is open. What I'm trying to say is that this problem is not made more, uh, is not made different from, uh, is a, a problem that is existing per se, independently from AutoML, right? And I disagree on, the, on what you said, I understand the features, because you understand only a small set of features. Your problem is a very relevant one, and if someone in this audience will be able to come up with some new idea, this will be like, we are going to have you at Google. Uh, any other question? Two. Uh, can we give the microphone? Uh, tell me how we are doing with time, because I don't know how we are doing with time. Please. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my understanding of AutoML provided by Google is that you develop a model, but you're never going to be able to grab that model. You are relying on calling an API by Google to make inference. Right? Is it still the case, right? Uh, it's still, so, so, so uh, I rephrase the question. The question is, uh, once I build this model, can I get the model or can I go through an API to serve the model? Uh, in certain situations you can get the model, in other situations you cannot. Some of these tools are, it depends on, the, on what you are going to use. No, uh, uh, here there are classes. Some of them are, will give you the models, or will not give you the models. Okay, I thought, because is this something new, or is it always been like this? No, uh, in some of them, uh, because this question is coming frequently. 
So your yeah, question, is, question is coming very, very frequently. Oh, nice uh, some of them are giving you the model. OK. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Sorry, mine is just a quick question on Keras. What's going to happen with Keras now that you have integrated them in, into TensorFlow 2? So oh. Is development going to continue in parallel, or um, you're going to take over the, the development of the? Uh, I asked the same question to Frank Qua, so I'm reporting what he said. Uh, this is the author of, of, of Keras. Uh, for any future that he can imagine, uh, these two are maintained uh, bot. And if you think about this, it makes a lot of sense. Because people are, uh, here this discussion was about uh, TensorFlow. But there are many other uh, backends out of there. One is coming from Amazon, one is coming from uh, uh, Microsoft. Keras supports all of them. Keras has an intent to be a language that is portable across different backends, and that will stay. So if the API of Keras will evolve, TensorFlow will evolve at the same time, independently. Uh, sorry, in sync, but independent. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, this is what I heard from, from, from Francois, so I think that, that is the case. Uh, any other question? OK, thanks a lot. Grazie molto. Antonio, uh, but uh, please stay here a moment because I actually have a question. Oh, please. <laughs> and you cannot escape. Tell and uh, maybe it's the elephant in the room, and no one dare to ask that, but is AutoML going to make data scientists redundant? You actually answered, but I want to hear clearly from your voice. No, I think it will, uh, will make us probably more efficient. That's what I think. All of us will be will be more efficient because we start from a from, as you said, a very um, uh, well understood baseline, and so there is a competition to, to to improve on this. Plus, the other aspect that I want to say is what I was trying to say is that there are problems that we solve with specific domains, while we should also try to solve patterns, right? And many of these things are are, are patterns. Uh, my answer before was, uh, think about, this is Antonio thinking like this, think about the database. There are people who are optimizing this database. So there is an evolution, and I'm pretty sure we will adapt. It should be not only manual, that's what I, what I think. Thank you, uh, thank what you. What is the future of uh, competition platforms like Tableau with the development of automail systems? Uh, so do you think that it makes sense to have an integration with Kaggle and, uh, and uh, I mean, how is this is perceived, the fact that there are, uh, let's say, this baseline? Uh... My opinion. Please. It's tough to understand what happens because it's, uh, it's a brand new paradigm as well. I mean, we're entering a, a new phase where, you know, you're not using uh, your techniques by yourself. You probably specialize in a way, in a different way. I don't know where we're going. I have no idea. I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, I, of course, I don't, I can, I'm not able to predict. But I think that the paradigm is shifting. So per perhaps I have a one final question for you. Uh, some people at the beginning, but not many, were uh, saying uh, that they were already using AutoML. I've counted probably 10 people. Uh, how many people tomorrow will be curious and try to start using some, some tools? Because that's the intent of the presentation. OK, so if there are more people that are curious and start to use more tools, that's the intent of the presentation. Go and buy my book. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Grazie a tutti. Vorrei concludere, però, con un ringraziamento al nostro host, il Limiti, di cui anch'io adesso faccio parte per la perfetta organizzazione, la logistica e per questo fantastico spazio che ha messo a disposizione di questo evento. Senza i limiti non avremmo avuto Antonio stasera che ci ha veramente illuminato su un argomento. Ma Antonio ha affascinato un punto Prego. particolare. Quando finalmente tu hai spiegato che sta andando <coughs> verso la vera data science, che sta un po' finendo l'era del data wizardry, 
perché se mi chiedi spesso come faccio i modelli, io dirò che ho dei trucchi magici. Wingardium Leviosa di qua, Expecto Solution di là. E qualcosa esce fuori. Grazie. Uh, thanks a lot, Claudio, for inviting me in, in this place. Thanks. thanks a lot. Penso che possiamo adesso dedicarci al networking, il nostro fantastico buffet. Grazie ancora.